Joe. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. Well, it was a Christmas night crash with devastating consequences. A drunk driver struck and killed two members of his own family. They were all leaving the same party in Lark Harbor. And today, Walter Alfred Joyce was sentenced for his crime. Here and Now's Colleen Connors reports. This was an extremely emotional and difficult day in the courtroom in Cornerbrook and a very long time coming for Walter Alfred Joyce. The judge sentenced him to two years less a day for driving drunk and killing his sister-in-law, Marilyn Shepherd, and her husband, Merle. Joyce and the Shepherds were attending a Christmas party in Lark Harbor in 2016. The couple left the party first. They were walking in the middle of the road. Joyce left a short time after to bring the Shepherds' son home. That's when his vehicle struck the couple, killing them. Today, the courtroom was filled with family. Quiet, some crying, all leaning in to hear the fate of their son, cousin, brother. The Crown expected a tougher sentence, more jail time, and asked for three years on each count of impaired driving causing death. You know, it is a very serious crime with uh, very serious societal uh, implications, and, and uh, we want the message of deterrence and denunciation to get out there, and one of the ways that that happens is through higher sentences. Joyce had no prior criminal record, and he pleaded guilty to the offence. His lawyer is not surprised with the sentencing. Mr. Joyce uh, has been an upstanding member of society his entire life, and, um, you know, feels terrible that this has happened. Uh, but, uh, you know, he will have to face the consequences of, uh, of the outcome of this decision. Once Joyce is out of jail, he will face a two-year driving ban and three years of probation. He's been in custody since early March, waiting for today. This has been a long road to get here. And, uh, you know, this will bring some closure to my client uh, and to his family. Um, and now they can hopefully uh, start the healing process and move forward. Although we don't know exactly how Joyce feels about this decision, we do know that he will spend less than two years behind bars in a prison within this province. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, three snowmobilers on the northern peninsula were airlifted to hospital yesterday after crashing into a snow crater. Four riders went over the edge, plummeting 20 to 30 feet. A group of 18 had been out near Hawks Bay. Conditions were clear and sunny, but they didn't see the drop. No word on their injuries. Volunteers led the remaining group members out of the area. The hole is now marked with sticks and ribbons so other snowmobilers can spot it. A member of the Scottish Parliament is calling for an independent investigation into the treatment of a woman from this province. Deanne Fitzpatrick was photographed bound and gagged in an office chair nine years ago. Fitzpatrick works as a fisheries officer with Marine Scotland, and she alleges that her colleagues have subjected her to years of abuse. Rhoda Grant is Fitzpatrick's representative in the Scottish Parliament, and today Grant spoke to her fellow members about Fitzpatrick's situation. Over years, the oppressive behaviour is constant and undermining. For example, a fisheries officer has been off with the flu. The senior fisheries officer says, well, you could be like certain people, have a miscarriage and take six months off work. Initially, colleagues stuck up for Diane and said, that was nasty. The senior fisheries officer then leaned over his desk and said to Diane, no, that was not nasty, my dear, but I can be nasty. Later on here now, we'll hear more from Rhoda Grant. That's coming up in about 25 minutes' time. Well, former NLTA President Jim Din wants to run for the NDP in St. John's Centre. Each of the major parties now has a candidate confirmed or seeking the nomination in that district. Jim Din's brother is PC MHA Paul Din, who recently won the Topsail Paradise by-election. The Tories have confirmed ex-St. John City Councillor Jonathan Galgay as their candidate in St. John Centre. And communications professor and former Equal Voice Chair Lori Lee Oates has expressed her interest in the Liberal nomination. Well, there's also more political news. Someone who won't be running is PC MHA Keith Hutchings. He announced today that after 12 years, he is not going to be seeking re-election. Hutchings will continue to represent Fairyland until the end of the term. And a time frame for the provincial election, that's expected to be announced on Monday.
Well, it was a bright and sunny day across much of the island today and a sure sign of spring appeared, golfers. CBC's Fred Hutton decided to hit the links in search of brave souls. He found a determined crowd at the Pitcher's Pond Golf Course in White Way. They used a hammer to drive their tees into the frozen ground, but Fred didn't stop there. He also checked out the Willows in Holyrood ahead of their opening day tomorrow. All right, Jackie, so the sun is shining. It's the day before the big day. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? Oh, really excited. Um, Willows has historically been uh, one of the first courses to open in the spring. Um, it's an anomaly in the fact that it does come out of winter fairly quickly. And with the hard work of our course superintendent and his crew, they're able to make it playable. And that allows us to open the doors and allow the golfers to come in and dust off their clubs and get on the links. Thank you for coming to Willow. Is Ada speaking? For tomorrow afternoon, what time will open? How many players? Phone's been ringing today a bit there. We saw inside the staff are busy. They are. They started yesterday booking members and today booking the public. Uh, we have over 160 people playing just this weekend alone. Well, uh, an absolutely gorgeous day, as you can see by there. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, excited about the opening of the golf course. It's also, uh, you know, temperatures today we saw sitting between zero and six degrees through parts of the of Newfoundland Labrador as well. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay so far has reached a high near five degrees. Unfortunately, that's going to change as we head through the day tomorrow. We're looking at snow moving in tonight and much colder temperatures uh, through the afternoon tomorrow. But I have all those details in your full weekend forecast coming up. Well, after rejecting a proposal for a universal bus pass, students at Memorial University will soon be charged more to park their cars. MUN is doubling the fee for on-campus parking spaces, but whether the new price is a bad deal or a bargain, well, it depends on who you ask. Here now, Zach Gowdy has more. Even on a warm, sunny day, the parking lots at Memorial University are mostly packed. But starting next semester, the price of these parking spaces is going to double from $36 to $72 per year. We have about 3,700 parking spaces. We have about probably 18,000 potential drivers coming to campus every day. So we realize this was not sustainable. It's a challenge every year. Parking on campus is a hot commodity. There are just 240 spaces reserved for undergrads and permits are awarded in a lottery. Last year, almost a thousand students applied. The fee increase comes just two weeks after students rejected the university's U-Pass proposal, which would have put a Metro bus pass in every student's pocket. Munn says the parking fee is unrelated to the U-Pass vote, but the students' union says it's still an unwelcome surprise. Yes, yeah, so we were really upset to hear about that and a lot of students have been reaching out to us who were really upset to hear that. We've seen a lot of things on social media and things as well about students who were really surprised to hear this. Um, so I think it brings up a couple of issues, one of which is, again, um, having uh, consultations and communication from the university to students. Students didn't know this was happening and that definitely could have been avoided. Even with the price increase, $72 per year for parking is still a lot cheaper than in most parts of St. John's. The nearby Greenbelt Tennis Club sells its extra parking space spaces to students at a price of $150 per semester. But cheap is a relative concept and students say they're already strapped. I think it's unfair. I mean, we voted against the U-Pass for a reason. I mean, it's, it's hard enough being a student, paying insurance, paying for gas in our cars, and now on top of it, an increase in parking. I live in Paradise, so I drive here and I have a car that I pay for and now I got to pay double to park here. And if I don't get a parking spot, a parking permit, then I'll get a ticket and they're not cheap either, so it's not good at all. The new fees take effect on May 1st. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, some whip smart students from Memorial University are hoping to win big tonight at the Mel Woodward Cup. 
Here's how it works. Students show off their most creative and innovative business projects, and a panel of judges decides which idea is most deserving. They're looking for things like market potential and execution plan. Each winning team will take home $10,000, which will go toward furthering those ideas and getting into business. And a little later in the show, we'll meet some of the entrepreneurs vying for that cup. That's in about 25 minutes. Well, 20 minutes, right? That's all it took. The Toronto Maple Leafs are playing the Ottawa Senators at mile one in September. Tickets went on sale today and they were snatched up pretty fast. Yes, they were. Seats started at $144 a pop and there were plenty of fans willing to pay. Go Leafs, go! I've been a fan since I was born, 1966. I was actually eight years old last time they won the cup. They said they got five wickets open and they're going through pretty fast, so I'll get my tickets. No, oh God, we've, we've flown to Toronto for games before where we've had to pay $1,000 you know, for flights, $200 for hotel room, food, cabs just to see a game, so come in here and pay $120 for a ticket. I mean, it's not going to be all the, all the regular season gate players, but still, it's the Leafs, if you're a fan, you're a fan. Go Leafs, go! Woo! It's going to be amazing. Like, this place rocks anyway when there's any sports event, but the Toronto Maple Leafs come to Newfoundland, just as good as the codfish we're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you were able to reel in a couple of seats to the game, you can feel a little bit better about the cost. Toronto plays Ottawa Saturday, and tickets run as much as $450. Now, some people today had trouble getting their seats for September, the big game, but Mile One says its website did not crash. I can only imagine the, uh, the onerous tasks that the jury had uh, in terms of deciding who the winners were going to be. A huge literary award handed out in St. John's today. $12,500 to the winner, $3,000 for the runner-ups, runner -ups rather. More on that just ahead.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Bonus deadline is midnight, Friday, April 5th. Order now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, spring is here and so is baseball yeah, season. Opening day for the Blue Jays. Uh, for you fans, are hosting the Detroit Tigers tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it was such a nice day here as well. So we thought we'd have our own little opening day. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't look good. So uh, you dialed us up this great baseball weather. I know. I wish I could stay out here all night. What is it right now? Uh, Two degrees, three <laughs> degrees. Perfect baseball weather. It's all mental, isn't it? <laughs> totally. So it wasn't bad out there. I mean, the ground was a little hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's that? Right. Oh, yeah, there's this, though. Uh -huh. What's your favorite? I was just going to say, you're, you're a little more accurate at this than you are at the weather. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a good one. Did you see how hard she threw that? Yeah. You it, deserved it. it. All right. Yeah. First, whoa. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now, I'm throwing her these laser beams, and she's, like, chucking it as I if, like. I know that throw was high. See? <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. I dropped a few, though. Ashley, yeah. you are good. She is a good one. And you're good too, Anthony. All yeah, right. But, yeah. But you watch it there. Uh, she has good form here. Take a watch of this. She's got a fair bit of heat on these things. <laughs> it's true. Now, the only the only downside to being out there was a lot of fun. Oh. See, like, I should okay. not have sure. dropped that. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. That was not my finest moment, but it's early in the <laughs> Yeah. <day. laughs> yeah. Not my finest moment. Good thing got, it's opening day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a little upset because uh, some dude came by and made some comment about throw like a girl. Then I realized he was talking about me, so it was uh, <laughs> it wasn't as insulting as I thought it was. But it was a nice day to actually get out there, and it really was cold in the beginning, but it actually got kind of nice, right? As we were throwing moving yeah. around so much, yeah. Yeah. getting Anyhow, a warm. Won't up. be long when you can actually do that <sighs> I can't normally. Wait. I'm so excited. Yeah. That's my favorite sport. <laughs> Obviously. Yep. Yeah. So temperatures are going to be warming up some more. That's pretty nice. Yeah. We had another cold start to the day again today, sitting uh, in the minus teens. If you take a look at those temperatures and uh, warmed up quite nicely in the afternoon, uh, as we've just talked about, between three and six degrees in some areas as well that aren't on the map right now. But Happy Valley Goose Bay, five degrees was your afternoon high so far today. And as we head through the next uh, 24 hours, that's all good and change. We do have uh, some snow and uh, cloud cover moving through Labrador right now. Eventually, it'll make its way towards the island, but nothing but sunshine. Uh, it'll take its time to make its way towards the island, especially through the overnight for uh, central portions. And then the afternoon looks quite nice for most of uh, eastern Newfoundland. So here's a look at the future tracker. As we head through the night tonight, we can see some scattered cloud cover and uh, flurry activity expected. Along the coast, though, especially through the straits, that's where most of the snow will be. And it'll be heavy at times with some gusty winds through the overnight tonight. So you're looking at about maybe uh, two to five centimeters of snow. Uh, but overall, the temperatures won't be quite as cold as we've been seeing for the last couple of mornings, sitting around minus three to minus five. Uh, southwesterly winds between 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Uh, for the west coast, a little bit uh, higher. Exposed areas will likely see gusts closer to 70 kilometers per hour uh, with that potential for some flurries for Port of Baskin, minus 3. And then up through Labrador, uh, those cooler temperatures move in for Lab City, minus 19, but going to stay quite mild again for Happy Valley Goose Bay, only reaching uh, a low near minus 1 tonight. And uh, those south southwesterlies are going to switch to more westerly. Uh, that's the case right along the coast as well. Nain minus nine tonight, and Cartwright looking at minus three. Now the future tracker, as I mentioned, tomorrow is when things get a little bit more messy. Depending on the temperatures as well, it does look like things should start off as snow uh, for most of the west coast and the south coast, and then in the higher elevations for sure. But then the temperatures are going to climb up, which means things should change over to rain. We shouldn't see much in the way of accumulations other than. Uh, in the higher elevations and that will continue to track a little bit further east. You can see that cloud cover finally making its way towards the Avalon but not until the evening hours. So most of the day tomorrow actually looks quite nice. And then eventually things clear out for uh, up through Labrador and that's because the rigid high pressure moves in and that's why we're seeing those cooler temperatures. So uh, as far as snow, I mentioned we're going to see uh, the most of the accumulation will be around the streets. Could see between five to 10 centimeters of snow by the time uh, tomorrow night rolls around. And then with that, some stronger winds. So blowing snow will certainly be an issue uh, through the day tomorrow. But otherwise, here's a look at your forecast between uh, three to six 
six degrees with plenty of sunshine for the east uh, as we head towards the evening hours. That's when uh, we'll see some increasing cloud for both Clarenville and Bonavista, and then either rain or uh, snow changing over to rain. That's the case through central as well. Four or five degree highs tomorrow. Same along the west coast. Two degrees uh, it looks like for Port Basque. Same up through the northern peninsula and then up through Labrador. Plenty of sunshine thanks to that ridge of high pressure. Uh, minus 12 is your afternoon high for Lab City, but the winds are going to stay gusty again between 40 and 60 kilometers per hour. A little bit of relief in the afternoon, and then they'll pick right back up. Nain, you're looking at a high near minus 15 with plenty of sunshine. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead towards the weekend when I come back. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. Well, one of the biggest book awards in Atlantic Canada was handed out today in St. John's. It is our pleasure to announce the winner of the 2019 BMO Winter Set Award is Heather Smith. Smith took home the prize for her children's book, Ebb and Flow, which tells the story of an 11 year old boy who moves with his mother to a new town after his father was sent to jail. The two other finalists for the Winter Set Award were Robert Chafe and Melissa Barbeau. Smith thanked the jurors for choosing her book. And as a children's book writer, it feels awesome because I, I kind of feel like I was sitting at the kids' table and I got invited to the grown-up table for din-dins <laughs> because usually, you know, like these literary awards is you have your adult awards and you have your children's awards. So the people who are in the adult literature circles don't always know what's happening uh, with Canadian children's literature. To a story now about journalism and the law. A reporter has won a court victory over charges related to a protest at the Muskrat Falls worksite in 2016. Justin Brake was facing a contempt charge in civil court and his lawyers jumped in to stop it. Now that didn't work initially, but they were successful in the court of appeal. Cease Hare has the details. Emotions ran high in October 2016. It was a volatile time around the Muskrat Falls site. The tension was building for months. Some protesters at times blocked access. Unimpressed, Nelcor succeeded in getting an injunction, ordering them not to enter the site or block the entrance. But protesters marched through that injunction, breaking the lock off the gate and occupying a building for four nights. Justin Brake followed them into the site and stayed with them. At the time, he was working for an online publication, The Independent. Afterward, Brake found himself up against criminal and civil charges. Criminal charges filed by the Crown and a civil charge filed by Nalcor, charging him with contempt for allegedly violating the injunction. Brake's lawyers filed an application to have that stopped. Their application was denied. They appealed and won. The decision was released today. The Honorable Justice Green exercised the discretion of the court uh, to vacate the injunction uh, as against Mr. Brake and discontinue the contempt proceedings as against Mr. Brake. Brake's lawyer, Allison Conway, says they argued the fact that Brake was working as a journalist at the time was a material point. She says the decision is significant for journalists and journalism across Canada. The Honourable Justice Green took the opportunity to comment uh, both on the importance of, of journalistic work and how we need to be careful in crafting these court orders so that we're not uh, unnecessarily infringing the rights of journalists to do their work. Um, and he also uh, commented on the fact that this was an Aboriginal land protest as a matter of extra significance given the historic underrepresentation of that in the media. Justin Brake isn't done with the courtrooms yet. Nalcor could take this to the Supreme Court of Canada, and Brake still faces criminal charges, trespassing, and mischief in Happy Valley Goose Bay next month. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. I cannot repeat the language used here in the chamber, but it was racist, sexist, vicious, and degrading. This is what happened to Deanne Fitzpatrick, originally from Canada and a Caithness Fisheries Officer. Why this member of Scottish Parliament is taking up the cause of a woman from this province. Shocking picture of Deanne Fitzpatrick taped to a chair, her mouth taped shut. That made international headlines. The latest on her case is next.
Welcome back to Here Now. A member of the Scottish Parliament says a woman from Newfoundland continues to be mistreated at her workplace. This years after a photo of her bound and gagged made international news. Deanne Fitzpatrick alleges that her colleagues at Marine Scotland verbally and physically abused her. And today, her representative detailed Fitzpatrick's situation in Parliament. Imagine you return to work after a relationship breakup with someone who is a work colleague. That relationship has been short but devastating. You have to take out a non-harassment order against your former partner and you suffer a miscarriage. On your return to work, you ask your line manager for time off to attend counselling and he tells you to go on your lunch breaks. He knows you have a non-harassment order but threatens to send you to work in another office beside your ex-partner. Your line manager tells you, I think I will go off with stress. It works for some in here. Well, it should work for me. He also says, effing foreigners shoot each and every bee. Coming to our country, taking our money, expecting everything handed to them. He also referred to women in extremely derogatory terms. I cannot repeat the language used here in the chamber, but it was racist, sexist, vicious and degrading. This is what happened to Deanne Fitzpatrick, originally from Canada and a Caithness Fisheries Officer and I have been representing Deanne for a decade. The language her line manager used was commonplace in the office and often used to get in front of stakeholders. Deanne has been subject to institutional racism, sexism, harassment and abuse at the hands of Marine Scotland, a Scottish Government Directorate. Over years, the oppressive behaviour is constant and undermining. For example, a fisheries officer has been off with the flu, the senior fisheries officer says, well, you could be like certain people, have a miscarriage and take six months off work. Initially, colleagues stuck up for Deanne and said, that was nasty. The senior fisheries officer then leaned over his desk and said to Deanne, no, that was not nasty, my dear, but I can be nasty. After she became a whistleblower, support from colleagues largely disappeared. She was continually pulled up on little things where her male colleagues were not. Deanne's overtime was cut, she told senior management and HR, but nothing changed. In fact, it gets worse because Deanne is referred to by HR as a serial complainer. Deanne asked for time off when her mother was critically ill. The senior fisheries officer said she wasn't entitled. Other officers were given compassionate leave without quibble. Deanne was the only female fisheries officer in the office in Scrabster and she faced continued, continuous sexist and, uh, conversation and sexual innuendo. Deanne hears an officer making a racist remark and she tells him it is offensive. Her cousin is married to a black woman and she's very fond of her. The response from the colleague was shocking, derogatory and racist, so much so that I can't repeat it here. The senior fisheries officer then says, that is just effing up the population by them having children. The phrase he uses specifically to refer to her is, and, use, and is used by others in the office is so offensive, presiding officer, that you specifically asked me not to say it in the chamber and I can't even allude to it without causing offence. We all saw the pictures in the media of Deanne being physically restrained and taped to a chair and gagged. Officers photographed her to humiliate and degrade her because she spoke out about inappropriate behaviour in the workplace. We now need a truly independent inquiry into Deanne's treatment at the hands of this government and Marine Scotland. It cannot be put off any longer. Those applause for Rhoda Grant, a Labour member of Scottish Parliament, speaking in the debating chamber today. Now, later after that, I reached Ms Grant by Skype and I asked her what should happen in this case. Deanne just wants to get back to work and do her job and be left in peace to do that. And I think we should try and allow that to happen for her. But I think there has to be a full investigation because over the years, every time I have intervened, seen, things seem to improve. But then again, when no one's looking, they seem to go back um, almost worse than they were before. So we need to get to the bottom of it. We need to make sure that it won't happen again and that Deanne can return to her job in peace. 
Well, some keen and innovative students at Munn are hoping their bright business ideas will win them a big cash prize. We'll hear from some of the finalists coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, earlier in the show, we told you about the Mel Woodward Cup, a competition for Memorial University students with big ideas for business. Well, tonight, the top eight finalists with innovative startup ideas will face off in front of a panel of judges. Winners take home a $10,000 prize. I met up with some of the competitors earlier today. Kidney dialysis is a huge problem in our province, and there's no one-stop solution to this problem. So Nephropod is the first step towards solving this issue. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a sensor over here, and the person will stand over here, and there's a sensor down here as well, and sensor up here as well. So they'll stand here, put their hands up here, and it's basically like how you take your weight, same thing as that. You just put your hand over there, and then over a monitor over here, it's going to do it, tell you that how much fluid you have in your body. Since 2015, there's been a 36% increase in dialysis patients. The dialysis process, how it works is you have to go to the hospital in order to get your fluid uh, measurement, mm -hmm. in order to do the dialysis properly. So even people who are doing hemodialysis often end up going to the hospital, which I feel like it's unnecessary because if you're doing uh, hemodialysis at home, you should have the means, everything at home, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's also costing them money to go to the hospital, especially for people who are living in uh, remote areas who don't have access to a clinic right away, right? And they have to travel two, three hours. The dialysis clinics are extremely busy. And that's why the government is trying to push people so that they can do more treatment at home. And it's going to be very affordable for them to have it at home. And as opposed to just, you know, traveling all the time, taking a clinic hour, commute cost. More importantly, what we really figured is more than cost effectiveness or user friendliness, the problem has a deeper root. This really isn't about saving money, but saving lives. MeCharge is a human power harnessing technology that allows low-powered electronic devices to be self-charged constantly. Basically, it means that when you're using a wireless device, you're not going to have to worry about changing the batteries. So it's going to, through your interactions with the device, you're going to be able to charge it. So you don't have to worry about buying batteries, using cables, or wasting time charging the actual device. We're going to reduce or eliminate the single-use batteries mm -hmm. and the cables for the, uh, for the customer side. 
and uh, we're also um, going to be de less dependent on external power sources. I was at work one day and was using my wired mouse and I was realizing that I was clicking so much and moving it, it was a really big waste of energy so we had a discussion and decided that this would be a great uh, starting point to use our technology to develop our product. The energy harvesting technology is expanding recently so uh, uh, we did some research on what available harvesters we can use and um, we contacted some electrical engineers and uh, from their experience and together with our research we were able to come up with a technology that works for their product. And we hope to be able to um, use the technology and more devices to decrease the use of disposal batteries. We want a product that is environmentally friendly, uh, uses less batteries and waste, and allows a continuous operation of the device. Our business is Duff Ocean Resources, um, and our idea is to commercialize the invasive green crab species in the Atlantic waters of um, of uh, Canada. So our plan is to take the green crab and extract um, mid to high grade chitin. So chitin is the second most abundant biopolymer on the planet. Um, and uh, it's found in the shells of crustaceans and shellfish. So chitin is a highly effective uh, water purification agent. Um, it's all green and uh, it also is used in wound healing. Um, in bio it has biomedical uses. Um, and in addition, it is an uh, antibacterial agent in agriculture. The green crab is invasive and um, it comes from Europe. Uh, the reason why it's such a big problem is because it is very resilient to uh, any other predators that are in the water uh, and really takes over the waters wherever it goes. Uh, for example, any, it, it will, um, in the wintertime, it will burrow under the sand and it can destroy eelgrass, which acts as um, uh, cod nurseries for juvenile cod, which leaves the cod without somewhere to stay for the cold winter months, um, and ultimately they could end up perishing. Chitin from green crab isn't something that has been traditionally exploited, um, but is definitely something that I think is worth looking into. There's a ton of um, processes for extracting the chitin from uh, crab shell or crustacean shell, um, and one of which is the acid base process. Um, this process uh, leaves a ton of uh, waste, in, uh, and that waste is difficult to um, dispose of and it can get expensive. So part of our search tonight will be for um, someone who has experience with biopolymer extraction so that we can uh, refine our process to get something that's probably a little bit more environmentally friendly and hopefully more efficient as well. Wow. So Neat quite, ideas, eh? Yeah, some really interesting innovators from, and three very different ideas. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the big prize is tonight? Ten, yeah, 10000 And that's only three of eight. Okay. So there's some really good ideas being presented mm -hmm. uh, there tonight. So good luck to everyone. Yeah. More of a vigilante. Yeah. Taking matters into his own shovel. This Nova Scotia man was done putting up with potholes. His story. Stay tuned.
Weather update is brought to you by 811 Healthline. Medical advice, health information, mental health, and healthy eating. Dial 811. It's free and confidential. Welcome back. Yeah, so I'm just looking at my phone there after our little um, baseball episode. Mm -hmm. You've seen it already, right? Yeah, Teal Goulding, uh, good arm. Uh, Ashley, you throw much better than Anthony Germain. <laughs> Anthony, stick to the news. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, it was, it was opening season. It's opening yeah, day, that's true. Yeah, you're just rusty. Yeah, you're just rusty. Don't, you don't want to peak too soon. Yeah, no. Definitely yeah. not. Yeah. On to something else. Today <laughs> yeah. is, uh, was Thursday, right? Yeah, right. so Weather Whiskey Day. Mm -hmm. It is Weather Whiskey Day. Here is our newest member, Berkeley Mitchell. She, uh, Sent us a, a wonderful shot. She's eight years old from Torbay. Those are fireworks. Aww. CBC fireworks. You see them there? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, the logo. How, How great is that? That's so creative. She can draw the gem better than the, I can. Most people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done, Berkeley. Yeah, that's wonderful. And then there's her photo there. Oh. <laughs> Super cute. Yeah. Oh, you, did we do that in unison? Yeah, we did. did. Yes. <laughs> But how Very could nice. you not? That's Very right. Nice. So you will be getting a postcard in the mail. And uh, if you want to be part of our Weather Whiz Kid Club, send us your name, your drawing, your picture, where you're from, and I will uh, to nlphotos at cbc.ca, and then I'll, we'll, we'll get them on for you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So some nice warm temperatures coming in the next few days. How long is that going to last, though? Yeah, you, we're looking at a warm stretch uh, at least through the weekend, so that's okay. certainly good news there. Mm -hmm. If we take a look at the future tracker that brings us through to Saturday, we can see that uh, change over to snow again through the overnight, and that's because those temperatures are going to dip again. But it's looking like we're going to see a break through the day on Saturday with generally uh, looking at some cloud cover, through most of the island, up through Labrador, uh, generally clear skies, and that's thanks to a ridge of high pressure, but uh, some cooler temperatures. The next round of precipitation moves through uh, on Sunday, at least Saturday night into Sunday morning. That's where we're going to see mostly snow for Labrador, periods of snow at times. Again, uh, the potential for some accumulation, but uh, through parts of Newfoundland, it looks nice. We're going to see maybe some more rain again along the west coast, generally looking at a mix of sun and cloud or at least some sunny uh, peaks in the afternoon on uh, Sunday. So that's definitely good news there. But here's a look at the forecast. We're going to see temperatures sitting between uh, 2 to 5 degrees for most of the island towards the Avalon. It looks like we should reach a high near about 8 degrees through the day. Again, that uh, rain will move in. And then up through Labrador, mild again, still uh, sitting in the minus single digits. This is a little bit below seasonal for this time of year, but generally looking at a mix of sun and cloud with that potential for some flurries. Nain minus 9, Cartwright sitting at minus 6. So taking a look uh, into Sunday morning, we'll get a better picture here. That's when uh, the next push of warm air moves in. So we're going to see uh, overnight on Sunday when that next uh, system will roll in for parts of the Avalon. Otherwise, we'll start to see some warmer air creep up up through uh, the uh, up through Labrador. So things will likely change over, especially for the southeastern portions, to rain. And then it takes its time moving. So it's going to stick around for a while, right through Monday as well. That's why we're seeing uh, these warmer temperatures continuing as well. But in behind that, those cooler temperatures for Labrador. And then we get back into that uh, northwesterly flow. And that's when we're going to see that potential for a few flurries as well. Eventually, things clear out as we head through the day on Tuesday, and that's thanks to another ridge of high pressure. So here's a look at the next uh, couple of days in the forecast. There you go, 6 to 10 degrees as your afternoon highs. Saturday and Sunday, not too bad, really. It'll be a mix of sun and cloud with that potential for showers either in the morning or uh, through the overnight. Monday looks more gray, though, and 9 degrees. And then Tuesday, we're back down to uh, seasonal but with uh, generally fair skies. Now for central, even warmer, it looks like it could reach a high near 10 degrees on Sunday. Monday looks like about uh, 10 degrees, or rather 12 degrees on Sunday, 10 degrees on Monday. And uh, two, by the time Tuesday rolls around, that's when we'll see the best chance of seeing some sunshine. Western Newfoundland, uh, towards the evening hours on Saturday, either rain or snow. And then uh, rain again on Sunday, nine degrees, and then six on Monday. So certainly uh, nice temperatures there. For Eastern Labrador, generally sitting in the minus single digits right across the board uh, and then sitting around 
minus 6 for Monday with that potential for some flurries. And then for Western Labrador, plenty of sunshine tomorrow thanks to a ridge of high pressure. Those temperatures are going to drop minus 12, but then recover as we head towards the beginning of next week. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo in a little bit. Thanks, Ash. It was that time of year that drivers like the least, especially here mm -hmm. in town where everybody complains as an annual tradition. It's pothole season. Well, it's not just here in St. John's and not just in other parts of Newfoundland and Labrador. Roads across the country are checkered with deep craters that can smash up some tires. Yes, eventually municipal workers come along to repair them. But this spring, one young man in Nova Scotia decided to fix his town's potholes himself. Right, but there's always a problem, Carolyn. Sometimes if you mix pot and holes, you can get into trouble. Here's Colleen Jones. <laughs> John McHugh doesn't wear a cape, and he says he's no pothole superhero. It's more of a vigilante. Yeah. If horns and thumbs up are any indication, drivers in New Glasgow seem to appreciate this pothole vigilante. He came out a couple of days ago with a shovel and filled the potholes. The worst holes were right in the middle here. Uh, and uh, that's going to be the far one right in the middle, right in the center. And then there's one on the right side. Uh, all the there, so. uh, it's kind of hard to see now since it's all flat, but uh, just imagine uh, about a hole that goes eight inches into the ground. What sparked this? Well, he was out driving with his mom and they kept hitting pothole after pothole. It hit so hard and I said to her, I'm going to come out here tomorrow. I'm going to fill those holes. And she probably thought I was joking, but I wasn't at all. So. Now, it's not a perfect job, but most say it's better than the holes or waiting for the right department to come and fix them. His sign says, I filled the potholes, pay me instead of your taxes. And people did give him change or coffee or his personal favorite, pot for filling the potholes. Yeah, pretty ironic, pot for pot, that's good. Yeah. And while the pot part is legal, turns out filling potholes is not. That brought the law out. The RCMP did come and uh, they did speak to me. Uh, they informed me that I was committing a crime. So his pothole filling days are over, but he's basking in his newfound popularity. Some are suggesting the unemployed 22 year old get the province's top job. McNeil's job, you already ahead of him. Did you hear the person that said you should oh, run yeah. for <laughs> Premier? Yeah. The drivers are waving and honking their thanks. Some stop and chat. You gotta do it, and I appreciate that he did. Now that he's found out filling potholes isn't legal, his shovel will sit idle. He's heading out west soon for a job in Alberta. Maybe some busking on the side, but his pothole filling days are behind him. Colleen Jones, CBC News, New Glasgow. Right. All right, to another story now. You've heard about measles outbreaks in several places across the country and the United States as well as the struggle to contain them. Well, now one county in New York State is taking some drastic measures to stop an outbreak. As Stephen D'Souza reports, it's banning all unvaccinated children and teenagers from public spaces. Blood work, blood work, yes. It's right here. When the state of emergency was declared north of New York City, Renee Cahan knew she had to do her part. I felt this was my responsibility. You know, as a citizen living here with this outbreak, I wasn't taking any chances. Officials say the dramatic step, banning anyone under 18 who was unvaccinated from public places like shops, schools and restaurants, came after repeated efforts to reach those people met resistance. We have sent people out from our department into the community to right, go right to the people's houses and they've, um, those that do not cooperate, they have slammed the door, they've opened it and said don't come back. The focus has fallen on the area's large Orthodox Jewish community. Officials aren't giving an exact figure, but the vast majority of measles cases are here. Officials say the outbreak began in October when an unvaccinated resident visited Israel and contracted the measles. The resident then returned home with the disease. Around that time, six other unvaccinated people also visited Israel, all came back with measles. There are now 155 cases in this county alone. Adding to the challenge of reaching this community, official looking magazines like this, spreading anti-vaccine messages and sowing distrust of the health system and government. This local Jewish leader says rabbis have been trying to counter the anti-vax messages coming through social media and elsewhere. There is a affirmative commandment to go get themselves vaccinated. You're not allowed to take unreasonable uh, risks with your health. 
and not getting vaccination is an unreasonable risk. Officials say the goal of the emergency declaration isn't to arrest people in the streets, it's to send a message. But with only about 35 people taking up their offer of free vaccines and thousands still unvaccinated, their work is far from over. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Rockland County, New York. Thousands of people on both sides of the Atlantic, including some Canadians, have been left stranded after budget airline Wow Air abruptly shut down. I was scrolling through Twitter and doing some tweeting and saw a Bloomberg headline showing that Wow Air had uh, filed for bankruptcy essentially and that all planes were grounded. Today, the Icelandic company said all its planes have been grounded, including scheduled flights out of Toronto and Montreal. Around 2,700 travelers are affected. Since 2011, the company has offered cheap flights between Europe and North America, often for as little as $99. WOW had been trying to find investors to solve its financial problems since the middle of last year. Well, it was a fight to the finish, but in the end, only one book was left standing. CBC's Canada Reads has picked its 2019 champion. By chance alone is the winner of Canada Reads 2019. Science journalist Zaya Tong successfully defended the book by chance alone. Holocaust survivor Max Eisen relives his family's deportation to Auschwitz. And in the final round, that book beat out Holmes, which is a memoir of a teenager who emerged from a Middle East war zone and found safety here in Canada. The other entries in this year's battle of the books were Brother, Suzanne, and the Woo Woo. Take a look at our weather photo today. Wow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful blue bird sky again. Nice. Not complaining. No one's complaining about that. What do you think? West Coast? Yep, somewhere. South Coast? No. Nope. Not the South Coast? No. Someone was on a uh, little bit of a road trip, so I'll tell you where this photo was taken when we come back. Spring is in the air and the flowers in Vancouver are in bloom. Mm -hmm. CBC's Evan Mitsu captured these beautiful pictures of plum blossoms 
Now, they might look like cherry blossoms, but they don't get nearly as much applause. Oh, they're beautiful. They bloom around the same time as the cherry trees, but are much more fragrant. Uh, if you look closely, you'll notice that plum blossoms don't have a split on the end of their petals like a cherry blossom does. Oh, I didn't know that. You're such a gardener, you are. <laughs> now, according to Tree City Canada, it's like walking through a celestial palace. Pretty gorgeous. Oh. I would love to be there. Yeah, and if they ever invent smell a vision, you'll be able to know what it smells like. Because whenever you're <laughs> scratch in those the screen, it's beautiful, sniff. <laughs> right? Another story for you: an incredible treasure from the deep to show you, jewelry lovers. Wow, that's a golden octopus, but the gem it's surrounding is what's so rare. It looks like a giant tooth, but it's actually a huge pearl. Possibly the biggest natural pearl ever found. It weighs more than 27 kilograms. Now that looks does look like a giant tooth. Now, it it really does. I That's think exactly some what dentist looks. should have that in his office <laughs> or like her office. Dinosaur molar or something. Yeah, the <laughs> owner is not a dentist though. Actually, he's a mineral broker in Mississauga, Ontario, who's looking for a place or a museum to display it. I kind of like the octopus. It's yeah. neat. Yeah. Uh, his family in the Philippines kept the giant pearl as an heirloom for decades, unaware of its value. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's been appraised for as much as ninety million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah which is what we'd probably have to pay anyone to wear it. Nice pearl. What do you even do with nice it? Nice pearl. I don't know. Yeah. $90 million? But you just, it's just there and it's probably Imagine. really heavy. Got this gigantic oh, no white doubt. tooth yeah. in my closet. <laughs> no, it's a pearl worth $90 million. What have you been waiting for? <laughs> lucky man and lucky family. Well, here's another gem of a photo. Yeah. Beautiful shot there. The mountains give it away, of yeah, course. Yeah, you got that during the commercial break. Woody, Woody Point. Uh, yeah, I know that I've seen that. Gorgeous. It's yeah. nice. It's it frozen is. pretty solid. It is, yeah. All that ice is jammed in there. Uh, Gene Simmons Brown uh, captured that photo on a road trip on a spring day. So thank you so much for nice sending shot. that photo in. Yeah, if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Won't be long. People will be kayaking there. Mm -hmm. Right, get some boats out there. Thanks a lot for watching. Time to go play some more baseball. They're gonna work on that. <laughs> work on that. Work on that 90 throw. mile an hour fastball. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Have a great night. Good night.